Okay. So today's topic is naming what is sacred. And as I usually like to do when I start these workshops is to um, start with a poem that has something to do with that term sacred, um, something to do with kind of the way I feel about what is sacred. And this poem comes by Hafiz. Hafiz was a, would have been a 12th century, 1300s um, Persian Sufi poet. And um, this is called Now is the Time. Now is the time to know that all you do is sacred. Now, why not consider a lasting truth with yourself and God? Now is the time to understand that all your rights or your ideas of right and wrong were just a child's training wheels to be laid aside when you can finally live with veracity and love. Now is the time for the world to know that every thought and action is sacred. That this is the time for you to compute the impossibility that there is anything but grace. Now is the season to know that everything you do is sacred. So I wanna begin just looking at a couple of aspects of that term sacred. Um, for me, it, it really has two kinds of meanings. Um, the first uh, being what we often think of is that something that relates to our religion or the spirituality of a person, um, be it Christian, Muslim, Jew, uh, or even an atheist. People, uh, tend to hold on to our possessions, they, our beliefs or our customs that become sacred to us religiously. Um, you might think of the cross hanging on the wall in, in your dining room or um, the mitzvah that hangs on the door of just about every uh, Jewish home. Um, those things being sacred to the person that, that owns them. Um, some might call them idols. Uh, the Greek Orthodox often use idols uh, as part of their sacred practices. Um, some of them might be archetypes of angels, whatever it might be. By understanding what's sacred to each of us, a person's life then can easily be filled with de dedication and devotion to that that is sacred. And to not have that blessing is kind of equivalent to not having water in the desert. It's a feeling of helplessness. On the other hand, um, people often interpret the word sacred in reference to something that's precious uh, or cherished. To have something or someone to appreciate as a, and value is a true blessing for us. It doesn't have to be just one thing though, uh, a memory, a place, or a person. Everyone and everything has a different level of importance or value. So we can have multiple possessions or beliefs. Um, and it's not something to be embarrassed by. You know, what is sacred to each of us may, may not be sacred to someone else and, and vice versa. But that's really the beauty of our diversity is that we can hold things as sacred uh, as individuals and appreciate what others hold sacred. Um, both senses of that word are kind of a, are very important in our lives. Um, some people may only relate to the one meaning of it, which is fine, but you can apply what we're talking about here to either or both of the meanings. To think that each one of us, whether we're theist, agnostic, or atheist, we need access to whatever is in our heart and what feels most precious and most worthy of protection. Imagine, if you will, a life in which nothing was sacred to you or anyone else. 
it would most likely be very barren and gray. And yes, some terrible actions have been taken in the name of, of sacred things, but terrible actions have been taken for all kinds of other reasons as well. The notion of the sacred is not uniquely awful, an awful source of bad behavior. Um, kind of looking at that, um, I kind of went down the path of Rene Girard's theory of mimetic desire and how that can lead to violence in our society. And I think we're seeing some of that now is, is mimetic desire is desire for things that others desire simply because others desire them. And um, his theory is kind of interesting when it comes to reading through the scriptures. And um, is that Dave? Is that like I want the latest iPhone because other people want the latest iPhone? Kind yes. Of, okay. Kind of thing. Yeah, and that's yeah. many times we we search for the sacred in in what others desire. Mm -hmm. Miming mimetic desire means we're miming others in our desire for things, and mm -hmm. and I think desire our own desires the way that we're made um, psychologically affects the, the things that we hold sacred. So the question is, um, what is sacred to you? And by asking ourselves that question, it helps us reflect upon what we believe in. Um, and in addition to the religious sense of the word sacred, it also includes our thoughts our morals and our values. It helps us understand our own self better through the contemplation and comprehension of our own thoughts. Now, um, Nina sent out something a couple of weeks ago on the Enneagram. And I found for me that the Enneagram has been very helpful in helping me understand um, those those thoughts, those things that I desire um, from others, um, the way that I value myself, the way that I want others to see me. And by see me as my authentic self rather than my ego self. And so that's been very helpful. And if you have a chance to look into the Enneagram, I would I would hope that you would you know, peruse that a little bit. So by understanding what's sacred to each of us, we can keep our emotional health in check. Um, people often fail to recognize that they're deteriorating mental health until they're diving in a void of confusion as to what they hold sacred and why they hold it. And trauma will, will do that to us. It shakes us up to the point where we're confused about what truly is sacred to us. What experience provides us a sense of delight and contentment? What things bring relief? And which person or place or thing helps us remain calm? And another advantage of filtering these thoughts through, uh, in co through contemplation helps us have somewhat of a control over um, what I often call monkey mind or monkey chatter in our mind, um, <laughs> telling us all different kinds of things. Um, it helps us gain some of that control and to remember the good things as opposed to all of the negative things that happen. Um, Rick Hansen, who's a psychologist and, and writer, talks about good memories tend to be like Teflon. Oh. Whereas bad, bad memories are like Velcro. They tend to stick even when we don't want them to. You know, good memories kind of roll off and we forget about those, but it's always the bad memories. So um, this part of, of determining what's sacred can help us control that process. Um, it continues to remind us of what is sacred to us in our daily life and contributes to the way that we think about that. So understanding what is sacred and naming it remains a mystery for many people. However, 
finding the th sacred things in life isn't really a tough job. All you need to do is realize and acknowledge the things that you, bring you comfort, meaning, and peace. And it may be something that you do every day or something you may yet try, something that you haven't tried yet. And the only key to finding what's sacred is to be open-minded, to explore, and to be accepting. I think we talked a little bit about acceptance the last time I did prayer lab. Um, and a major misconception about that uh, is that what is sacred always remains the same. And that really couldn't be further from the truth. Uh, the base of what is sacred to each of us may remain the same, but nothing in life is ever constant. So as you wake up each day, you understand that your identity is not reflecting who you really are. Um, so even after we find what's sacred, our search may never stop. So as human beings, our human emotions continue to change and attractions differ while we're growing up. Maturity changes us to a great extent and things that I used to hold sacred when I was younger um, have lost meaning in many ways. Um, and things that I didn't realize that I cherished, I cherish much more deeply now. So how do we go about doing that? Well, for an overview, I want you to notice kind of how you feel about the idea of that term sacred. Are there any mixed feelings about that term for you? Um, how has the rise of religious fundamentalism, um, Christian nationalism over the last few years, the culture wars in general, um, affected our attitude towards what is sacred? Have you been told certain things that were sacred in your life that you no longer believe in? So by taking a little time to sort that out for yourself, also maybe talking with others, we can clear the decks a little bit so that we know um, what is sacred to each of us. So if you would grab your pen and paper, we'll take a little contemplative time now and I'm going to ask some questions, hopefully that will stir some things in you. Um, and you can write them down as you want to. Um, if you want to begin this time uh, for silence, we'll focus your thoughts beginning with your breath. You may want to gaze down at the blank sheet of paper in front of you. You can close your eyes if you can write with your eyes closed, whatever. Um, but let's take a, a minute now to just be silent and to focus on our breath, center ourselves right now. Let's take a deep breath in, pause and release. Feel the tensions drain out of you with that breath. Breathe in and release. Make a clearing in your mind. And in this clearing, there are many ways to identify what is sacred for each of us. Maybe you already know. You may remember a place or time that is particularly peaceful or meaningful. Perhaps on the edge of the sea, 
curled up with a tea in your favorite chair or in church or a religious gathering. And then softly raise questions in your mind like these. What is sacred? What inspires awe? What brings a feeling of protection, reverence, a sense of something holy? Let's take a couple of minutes now to reflect on those questions. And I'll repeat them. What is sacred? What inspires awe and wonder for you? What brings you a feeling of protection, of reverence? A sense of what you hold holy. different answers come to different people. And oftentimes they may be wordless because for many, what's most sacred is transcendent, luminous and beyond language. I'll look at those things that you've written there and whatever has come to you. Explore what it's like to open it, receive it, and surrender or give yourself over to it. And make it concrete for you. What would a conversation be like? Or what would your day be like if you did it with a sense of something sacred to you? without any stress or pressure, see if there could be a deeper commitment, a deepening commitment to this something sacred to you. How do you feel about making a sanctuary for it in your attention and intentions? And then how do you spend your time and other resources? Then when you do sustain a sense of the sacred or involve it somehow in some action, sense those results and let them sink into you. However, it shows up for you 
The sacred can be a treasure, a warmth, a mystery, a light, and a profound refuge. Let's bring our attention back to the room and to the group around us. Um, does we, anybody have any comments about their feelings of that little exercise and how that may help you in the future as you take time to contemplate, you know, what is sacred in your life and, and how that sacredness shows up? This was really cool, Dave. I liked it. It, it reminded me of um, like kind of a very intentional mindfulness practice of just like, if I could just get my brain in the space that I actually physically am, uh, I, I you know, you know what I mean? That there's so much just like everyday things that is completely beautiful and sacred space um, if I can just allow myself to experience it in the moment. And that's that's really it. It's it's being in the moment and and being able to look deeply at the things that we take so for granted, the ordinary, you know. <laughs> Sorry, Pastor Dunn. Anyone, any, anyone want to share? one of those things that they've written down um, that's, that's really <clears throat> been sacred for them. As I said, each one of us has different things that are sacred. I guess my time of, of this is Karen. I guess hey, Karen. The, yeah, the time that I'm able to either sit or walk outside with nature, is a very sacred time to me. That makes sense? <laughs> Certainly. Sure. No, I learned a lot of that through prayer. <laughs> in the moment. Being, you know, for, me, uh, for me, that feeling is being able to connect with something that's greater than I am. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that sense okay. of surrender to that something that's greater than I am. Because if my ego gets in the way and thinks I'm greater, then I become my own God okay. in that sense. Um, and I, I do find my, my morning meditation, that's a sacred time for me. That's my time to, I often call it my GPS, my mm -hmm. God's, God's positioning system, because <laughs> that's when I, I connect in the morning to find out what God has for me for the day. And to, <laughs> try to get myself in that mindset so that when I do um, meet with those things that don't go my way during the day, I'm more willing to accept them um, mm -hmm. because I can't control them, so. Yeah, I, the morning time for me, my holy rocking chair. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to push the pause button. Um, and so the holy rocking chair in the morning becomes with my cup of coffee and my God time. But I'm also sitting here thinking about, um, for me, sacred things are connected with either special memories or special teaching. A really profound moment for me was when I did the Benedictine pilgrimage tour with the Abbey. And we had mass at the grave of St. Francis. That was just profound. Um, and then again, uh, it was St. Benedict, because um, those are two that are really meaningful to me. And so those were very sacred moments. Yeah. Being, at the, being at the cave in Subiaco, um, 
which I renamed my apartment during pandemic as <laughs> Um That was my cave during that time. It became a very meditational experience. Yeah, yeah. There's those those times in our experience coming up on uh, Palm Sunday. Um, a couple of years ago when we were in uh, Jerusalem, I was standing on the top of the Mount of Olives, which looks down into the old city of Jerusalem. And looking down that hillside, which if you've ever been to the Mount of Olives, that whole hillside is a graveyard. That's tombstones all the way down. Okay. And on the other side of that, is and this when I call it a mountain it's a hillside but looking down that hillside and thinking about how Jesus had ridden down on the colt and come across through the valley of Gethsemane and then we were standing and looking at the door that door has been blocked off into the old city of Jerusalem but just standing at the top of the Mount of Olives and looking down at that and thinking that this is where Jesus was at that time when he was riding into the city um, just before his death was just that was just a sacred moment and, and we have those and we can keep those with us as as you were talking about that that mass is with you still and you can call that up anytime you want to know that that was a sacred moment in your life and that you can reconnect to that sacred moment and oh, hold that and cherish it some of those are not the kind you want to go around singing hallelujah about. Um, <laughs> for, for me, for me, one was we were standing at the ovens at Buchenwald, mm -hmm. um, wow. and our group leader started us singing, Were You There When They Crucified My Lord? I cannot sing that anymore without seeing the ovens and hearing yep. the stories of the people that were burned. Um, and mostly alive, um, I, I can't let go of that, and I don't want to. Mm -hmm. Right. That again? Buchenwald? Buchenwald is a, a Nazi death. Okay, I, thought, I was thinking yeah. it was Nazi, but it was. Yeah. I wanted to make sure. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I mean, <clears throat> that was just profound. Or at uh, Auschwitz, we were in the room where they were storing all the children's clothing and toys. And our, our group leader again did it. I was just a sobbing mess as he yeah. started singing, Jesus loves me. Um, I can't sing that anymore without seeing that room. <laughs> yeah, those memories are are something to cherish um, and hold sacred for us because they have such deep meaning in our lives. Felt the same way. There was no hallelujahs involved with either one of those. No, the Shoah Museum and in uh, Jerusalem and um, even even the uh, Holocaust Museum that's in uh, Washington, D.C. is very mu moving to see all of those shoes um, from the people that were put to death. Uh, there's just... Uh, yeah. Kind of yeah. There and think about the, the small feet that went in them. Yeah. So, well, we'll close our time here with a bit of prayer. I see Cliff is with us. Our <laughs> thoughts and prayers go out to both Cliff and Sharon and the loss of their daughter in law, Sarah Watson. Um, her memory will always be sacred and cherished by them and all that knew her. Um, our blessing goes to Tyler and to Julia and, um, in their time of loss and grief. So, dearest Heavenly Father, we pray to you uh, for comfort and peace for the Watson family, uh, for Sharon and for Cliff and for all that knew their dear Sarah. And we pray that your presence in our lives, um, in, in our relationships that we hold dear and sacred, continue to be in our memories. Um, bless all of those that gather um, for her celebration of life 
um, for safe travel for all that are coming and, and traveling back and forth to Maine for the event. We pray that you would guide each and every one of us each and every day so that we might find the sacred in the ordinariness of our daily lives, that you will always be present. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.